give us his viewpoints on this topic. Thank you. Very good morning to each and everyone. I'd like to start by sharing an anecdote with you. That would take a couple of minutes. Later on, I will move on to discuss three specific aspects. First of all, the work that we have been conducting since the International Federation of Human Rights, together with the 378 members in across more than 100 countries. And then also I'd like to share with you successful cases that we had in case of implementing universal jurisdiction. Then I will also share with you things that or cases that are not that successful and then possibility to implement universal jurisdiction on moral personalities or moral persons. And then I will finish off with some recommendation. 10th of December 1998, we were invited by the French government to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. At that time, we had a friend, and she was the president of the Association of Victims or, or Relatives of People who had been enforced to disappear. Then the House of Lords. Uh, was at that time debating whether he was going to grant immunity to Pinochet or not. My friend, she was sitting next to the relatives of Pinochet. She could not speak any English, and then she asked the camera man who, from Chile who was there shooting the uh, act to ask him to point to her and to tell her like if what one of the lords was saying was favorable to justice and as i do give me a thumb if it what he says is in favor of justice and then thumb down if it was against uh, justice and then well that was what happened she was extremely anxious in that situation and then she tells us when she well they can hear the decision of the first uh, lord and then the cameraman you know put his thumb down and then well all the supporters of pinochet started to be very happy and she started to feel that her heart was breaking then the second lord uh, takes a look at the cameraman and then the cameraman again thumbs down thumb down and as he says I've, I've lost my life you know this is just inconceivable and then supporters of Pinochet again very happy and then the third lord then the cameraman showed her thumb up and the she could feel that at the time that there was a human right defending or advocating for dignity. Then the fourth uh, lord thumb up again to cameraman, and then she started to feel the concern by relatives. Then the fifth lord again thumb up, and then justice won. This is a historical decision, a historical ruling it will be discussed for centuries for centuries the house of lord withdrawing immunity to from pinochet and well we all know the the end of the story but our friend was telling us the relatives of pinochet burst into tears i've been crying all my life to me that time was a time of elation. Well, Sola is, has passed away now, I would like to pay tribute to her through my intervention. Well, she taught us a lot about her great resilience and all the hard fight and all the hard struggle that she uh, fought. Well, actually, as I was mentioning before, the International Federation for Human Rights has represented more than 600 victims in 45 uh, different uh, national situations. So first of all, well, we really want that justice to be implemented, to be enforced in the respective countries. We want the states of law to be effective in every single place in the world. But we also accompany them whenever they appear before different courts, African courts, Cambodia court, also ICC 
when they appeared before the ICC, represented victims of the RDC, or from RDC. So we are conducting work, and I'd like to share with you, because I think that should be included as one of the recommendations of this conference. So here we are talking about, in our work, we are talking about specialized units lawfully created about international crimes. We have contributed and have um, to that, that these specialized units have been created in six European countries, France, Belgium, Holland, the Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, and the UK. The, and then, following suit, Canada was the last country. In France, we have two judges, two public prosecutors, and two policemen specialized in international crimes when they will have the possibility to contribute to a case or a court of universal jurisdiction. Well, of course, taking into account the limitations given or introduced to that law, but also within the context of international cooperation in prosecuting international crimes, so does this, uh, the members of this specialized unit can have, well, not only basic, but a specialized knowledge and know-how about the topic. And I think this is an initiative uh, that should be promoted in all the countries. And we insist we are these specialized units should not be created only in countries where crimes are committed, but in other countries that could contribute to preventing uh, commission of those crimes. Now I'd like to share with you successful some, some successful cases. The first one was mentioned by Professor Da Silva this morning. In July 2005, we contributed to the convention of Eli Uldat, Captain uh, Colonel from Mauritania. In the 90s, he committed, he tortured hundreds of people, of black people within the army. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. And as you know, he appeared, he presented his case before the ECHR. The court recognized the jurisdiction of universal jurisdiction of France. And well, recognized that his, his conviction. Then we have the SAIDE police commissioner from Tunisia. He was sentenced in September 2010 to 12 years of prison from on charges of torture. In the third place, also represented victims. 25 years of prison were given or to Pascual de France, he was a captain in the army before and during the genocide in Africa. After, well, when the Tutsis recovered the power in Africa, he fled to France and he was sentenced to 25 years for genocide. And also in second place, a historical milestone in December 2010. This was a time-consuming case. We had the participation of victims of human rights in Chile. So sentence of between 15 and 25 years of prison was given to 13 people responsible for committing torture during the dictatorship of Pinochet. So these are some of the successful cases. Regarding less successful cases, that also had some repercussions, as Wakan Khaled mentioned yesterday. It's about the reporting that we did or or the complaints that we launched in Germany in 2005 and in France in 2007 against Donald Rumsfeld. 
Indie money test said that the U.S. had sufficient, sufficient capacity to investigate and prosecute international crimes that may have committed by the heads of the military operations in Afghanistan, Iraq, Guantanamo, etc. So therefore, rejected the possibility of having a proceeding based on the grounds of universal jurisdiction. Well, France ended up uh, granting immunity to Rumsfeld. Well, as Welcome said yesterday, did we waste our time? No, I don't think so. Even if this type of decisions are being made by judiciary bodies uh, from political pressure, that does not mean that we have wasted our time. The fact of being able to single out uh, these people as perpetrators of international crimes do not longer make them heroes, but they just make them what they are. They are criminals. We in Belgium, we also contributed to proceedings, the proceedings carried out against uh, Mr. Havred, the Shad dictatorship case was discussed yesterday. Our Human Rights Watch has carried out wonderful work in this regard, continues to do so. And well, the Ministry of Minister of Justice of uh, Senegal now, well, now we, we, we trust, we trust that the Ministry of Justice in Senegal can, uh, is, will, will continue to cooperate with us. So I will be finishing with my presentation. So as we said, we initiated an endeavor against two French companies in, back in 2011. This was the Amnesis case. The company sold the government of Gaddafi technology that allowed Gaddafi to identify uh, people against the regime, and they were subjected and they, they, they were tortured as a result of that. And another one about Cosmos that gave uh, similar technology to the regime of Bashar Arafat and also uh, relating to people who were eventually tortured in Syria. We launched the complaint or in 2012. Unfortunately, the case has been reopened 1st of April 2014. We are uh, also working on a Colombian case. We have uh, lodged a criminal complaint before the Panama court against, contra, uh, against Maria del Pilar Hurtado, the head of the secret services of Colombia during the government of Alvaro Uribe. Alvaro Uribe helped her go into exile in Panama together with his friend, President Martinelli. What are we uh, reporting or denouncing? Psychological torture as well as political um, chasing. So there has been, at that time, there has been a systematic and ongoing harassment on anyone who was questioning the government of Mr. Uribe, anyone who would raise any open criticism against the government was being harassed. Here we are talking about journalists, advocates of human rights, or even judges from higher court. 
from the Constitutional Court and uh, from the Supreme Court of Justice. We supported our uh, complaint, documenting with evidence and documents of proving cases of death and threats of death. And we wanted to prove that the state had become political uh, police. We have made no progress in this case. The Panama justice could consider would consider the possibility to take action if extradition were to be denied. So therefore, Panama justice is obliged to pro investigate Mrs. Hurtado. However, the Panama justice has in that that it is strongly politicized. So hopefully, we hope that that will change by the time the presidency or the government will change. But it's important is that now Colombia is asking for the extradition of Mrs. Hurtado. So we've been asking or requesting that for the last three years. So there is an international arrest uh, warrant against Mrs. Hurtado. So we have gone two times to Panama to ask the president to revoke his asylum and so that she is extradited to Colombia. So to finish, so we believe that these exercises of universal jurisdiction are very helpful for the victims whenever the victims are see in that in their countries cannot really receive any justice. And whenever the, we have regimes that believe that are unbeatable or untouchable, but whenever someone singles them out and I say, you are murderers, you do not deserve any impunity. So this is a great hope. We, as advocates of human rights, so we want to, well, our mission is to keep that hope alive. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luis Guillermo, for your wonderful presentation. They are. Question for Luis Guillermo. So, to what extent do you think international human rights law will promote in uh, enforcing human rights law in multinationals? Can we go beyond national and domestic laws and go for an international binding law, binding international law? Thank you very much for this question, since I was ready to comment on your answer. Ecuador's government has put forward a convention to have serious violations of human rights uh, punished when, when those are promoted by large companies. This has already been designed and it has had the support of almost 80 countries to have this put forward, this proposal. But it is developed countries that oppose it and that's where we find large companies that give way to environmental crimes and also serious violations of human rights all over the world. We are supporting this proposal by Ecuador's government. We truly believe the United Nations need to provide protection tools to humankind in, in the light of this crisis, but we are far from where we want to be. Years ago, uh, well, I'm talking about my organization now, this lawyers group. We wanted to have an environmental interstate court that would help us break the impunity under which all these crimes are still openly com committed. So, in my federation, this has not been welcomed because they think it's a utopia. Uh, we're following the French disposition uh, or guidelines where we see that. And it is about being practical, being pragmatical. We see uh, cost effect 
relationship. And so Ecuador's proposal will not be accepted in the Council of Human Rights, and the court will not see live, not even in uh, within 50 years or, or 60 years, but still needs to be discussed the need to have factory powers, which quite often have a chance to pose the government, change the law, and then go unpunished. They need to be prosecuted and convicted. Let's explain to example. They are convicted in Ecuador to pay 9 billion euros. They go into bankruptcy in Ecuador, and they only have 300 fifty dollars in an account so you've got lawyers from the u.s with the victims and they buy out witnesses and judges and they talk to the law firm which was fam famous and texan texaco ends up forcing this law uh, law firm to pay 17 million euros in reparation and to admit that they had committed a crime against them. This is one of the main difficulties that we have. And we have it in, 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 in the South. Maybe we are not so practical. Probably if we were more practical, we wouldn't even have human rights. But what do we say back in the South? We need to be dreamers, but we need to work hard to make those dreams come true. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Fred Casas, anything else you would like to add? Yes, I think this is very important, and I think it should be in Madrid declarations. Well, it should be present. So, Mr. Now, Professor Now, it's right. Victims need to have reparation as part of justice, as the justice process. As for companies. We shared two examples. In the US, unfortunately, there are not limits set to this extra contractual liability by US companies that had contributed to the violation of human rights elsewhere in the world. So we have an action group working with different courts, international courts, uh, courts, working at a national and international level with interstate courts and international courts. This is something that needs to be done. But we also need a special task force to fight against the punity of companies all over the world. And so we make sure that the, the scope of their shameful impu impunity come, uh, are limited, are narrowed down. Impunity they still enjoy. Uh, and they've enjoyed for quite some time now. So for us, it is very important to think about this idea of reparation. It is true that the Inter-American Court, as you mentioned, has uh, issued important sentences in, uh, with regard to reparation, but they've made two choices regarding Colombia, which have narrowed down and have limited the standards of reparation. One that we dealt with in the case of the slaughter of Santo Domingo in December 2012, and another recent sentence after the slaughter in Takarica against a, a community of African origin or African descent, where we see that the Inter American Court is an, an element of pressure for the Colombian state. And so we think we are forced to protect those institutions uh, that fight and struggle for human rights. And again, we need them to be consistent. We need them to be coherent because there are some historical measures taken by those protection bodies and that need to be enforced.